all right, so Germany and development. Okay, well, let's go on to everybody's favorite topic, the big cats. Um, was was the tiger, uh, that, that nice big heavy monster, uh, one of the, the wonder weapons for politicians really start getting involved, or was there actually a doctrinal need perceived by the German army at the beginning of the war? Well, the, the Tiger I is, uh, is part of uh, the program where there was a uh, requirement for that. That was uh, basically a requirement that was drawn up in, I think, about 1938 for a heavy breakthrough tank. Interesting, Ken was talking about this coming from the Marine Corps, but the German army perceived that they needed a number of different levels. The main battle tank would have been the Panzer III, supported by a Panzer IV, and then they needed a breakthrough tank, a heavily armoured, well-equipped uh, vehicle, and that's the Tiger I. It just happened to evolve into the vehicle that it, it uh, came as in the end, but there was a whole series of test vehicles leading up to that. Of course, it's your, your favourite tank there, David, isn't it? Of course it is, of course, of course. <laughs> now uh, we've got one that goes on good days, yes. <laughs> um, I, I, I guess you can't really talk about the Tiger one and not mention Mr Whitman. And uh, you, you, were, you, were, you were doing some interesting digging there, Hilary. Well, I, I, kn I have seen a document uh, fr from the army, not from the SS, uh, saying that this guy is a danger to his crew. He's a danger to his unit. He's a danger to the whole front because he is indisciplined, doesn't follow the rules, and doesn't perform as part of a team. So the higher command in the German organization didn't like this guy or the people like him, but he was promoted by Himmler. Himmler wanted poster children for this idiotic political group that were running around taking a lot of the good equipment. The army didn't like that because they wanted properly trained soldiers to be running that equipment. And if you look, unfortunately, at the real statistics about how these guys performed in battle, you find that the real armored divisions are the Großdeutschland, the various Panzer divisions, but the, in general, the performance of the SS units is very poor. They have very high losses in material and men, and they don't achieve their objectives usually. They sacrifice themselves. All right, so uh, the Tiger, of course, also has um, the, 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 the fearsome reputation. So, so one, of, one of the examples, I think, of tank panic. So, uh, I mean, there, there were several tank panics or tank crises throughout the year. So, I mean, wh where would you start with the first one? Of, well, presumably 1916. I'd go right back to 1916, the very first. You imagine yourself in a German trench and the weather's not too good, and the clouds are rolling by, and after the barrage, these machines appear. I don't know whether you've ever seen any film or ever really seen a First World War tank moving, but they're incredibly spooky. You can't see anyone inside. You've got no idea there's any human beings involved. There are no wheels going round, so you can't see how it's going along, just tracks, so it appears to sliver across the ground. And you also get the impression a, that nothing will stop it, that it'll go in and out of any shell hole, cross any trench you put in front of it, and you can fire at it all day with your machine guns and it just sparks off. It's not quite like that, really. And what's going on inside is actually hell on earth. <laughs> um, but that is, that is what spooks people, and that is where the original panic for the human being, flesh and blood against the machine, comes from. It certainly influenced the German army again in 1918 with the um, uh, Battle of Amiens in August 1918. That threw an already fairly shattered army right back on its nerves and just the use of tanks really in large numbers. And the other tactic we had of attacking first in one place and then shifting to another to throw people off balance, it all brought in this the fact we'd also introduced a faster, lighter tank. I mean, they had a fast tank in the First World War. Eight miles an hour, this thing went. <laughs> <laughs> and it was getting behind the German lines and causing havoc. And this frightened people. Um, they got reported as being a lot faster than that. But that's where it all comes from. It's literally, I think, the human being trying to confront the machine that's trying to kill it. It's not easy. 
Then you also had that fun one in 1945 when the IS-3 shows up, and then all of a sudden you got, uh, we must have Conqueror, we must have M103. Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, what was Conqueror? Basically, they have an IS-3, we must kill it? Um, Conqueror came around because the IS-3 appeared on the Berlin Parade, and it was an utter total shock, the Allies. Um, low, big gun, sloped armor, and very effective looking wagon. Um, we had Centurion by then with 20 pounder, and it was found, well, British intelligence perceived that Centurion with a 20 pounder was totally incapable of engaging and destroying the JS-3. So quite a few fanciful ideas came up um, to try and destroy JS-3. Um, Conqueror was developed simply as a big gun with a, quite a sophisticated for the 1950s fire control system to sit back one bound behind the Centurions engage the JS-3s and destroy them before they could get near um, the Centurions. If it had come to the crunch, I think Conqueror and the M103 would have been able to do the job. The problem was both those vehicles are very cramped in the turret. When you walk around today, if you look at the size of the 120mm case, they are very large, they are very heavy. The War Office required Conqueror to be able to fire four rounds in a minute. That is not a, long, a very high rate of fire. Um, and you add into that the fact that it's got to do fire and movement, move back. Um, if you get a chance to look inside the vehicles, you'll see that it would have been a nightmare. Um, the War Office also gave Conqueror, I think it was 25 minutes, and its full bomb load would have been expended. But for what it was designed for, I firmly believe it would have done the job and destroyed JS-3. And uh, so M103, was that part of the Korean Thai crisis or the uh, just is Well, panic? there's a growing uh, perception after 1945 that everything we have in the inventory, Army and Marine Corps, is obsolete. The, uh, there are no funds to continue the heavy tank projects that Ordnance had in 1945-46, but the, uh, there are some pilot vehicles, there is some research, as usual. The Army's out of money, but it's actively pursuing components and research at all times. And uh, the growing concern about Russian armor and their intelligence rumors of laminate armor and all kinds of other uh, scary things that they might be up to, the Army develops a series of prototypes, new, light, medium, and heavy tanks that will be ready for production in the early 50s. Uh, the problem is you have this political shock called the Korean War, which qu uh, brings everything to a head. Is this just the Korean War, a regional conflict, or is it the first stage of World War III? In any case, we're, none of these things are in production. So there is a rush production to production of all these tanks. The difference is where for the American Army, the Ar Army staff objects to a third tank, the heavy tank. It understands the need for lots of light and medium tanks. But the idea of logistically supporting a third tank in the field boggles them. And of course, the transportation branch attests that there's not a single tank transporter uh, that can safely carry a heavy tank anywhere in the US or Europe, nor can a lot of the railroad tunnels in the US uh, allow a heavy tank to be carried on a rail car. So th they're trying to kill that right away. Instead, the Army staff embraces literally the silver bullet called uh, heat ammunition with their shape charge munitions using the Monroe effect. And they insist that the 90 millimeter gun of the medium tanks can uh, take care of all the, the Soviet heavies and any other problems on the battlefield. And this is why the Army takes only 80 of the heavy tanks uh, when, they, when they're put into production in a, in a rush in 1952. And of course, the, the, the irony of, uh, of the, all this, we must have something to deal with the Soviet heavy tanks, is IS-3 wasn't exactly the best thing on the battlefield anyway, was it? You had Team A and Team B, and it was Team B who built IS-3. Very snazzy looking design. I'm sure you've seen it. There's one over here. Take a look at it. Very futuristic, the round cast turret. The problem is, is that it, 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 it pushed the state of Russian metallurgy or Russian assembly technology beyond its limit. It had some significant problems, for example, with uh, welding the front armor. It had a whole series of mechanical problems. The vehicles hardly got into service before they had to be recalled to the factory for a significant rebuild program. 
Um, so there was a follow-on tank, which we don't see very much, or the, the, the NATO and the United States and various people weren't very threatened by because they simply didn't see it. There was another uh, design by the A-team, um, the IS-4, um, built in relatively small numbers, only about 100 or so. They ended up actually on the Korean frontier. So um, if there had been uh, Russian intervention in Korea, the tank that would have been encountered would not have been the IS-3, it would have been the IS-4. IS-4 was a much more successful design. Physically, it looks more like the IS-2, but sort of like an IS-2 on steroids, bigger engine, um, bigger turret, that sort of thing. Um, certainly a more fearsome design, and of course, it later leads up to the uh, the T-10, which is the ultimate member of the, the, the IS family. So yeah, the, 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 the strange thing is, is that this is a tank crisis where it shouldn't have been a crisis because the source of the crisis was so, so, something of a, 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 a weak paper horse. tiger. No, paper yeah. tiger. Uh, well, go on. Well, uh, the other big uh, tank panic was the one when the G's in, in Russia, and they were used to coming up against BTs, T-26s, uh, that sort of material, the French tanks. They, they had defeated all of these, and then suddenly they come up against uh, a tank that, in fact, uh, once again, isn't as good as it looks, uh, and the, they were well capable of knocking these out, but it caused the panic. And the effect that this had back along the line was, first of all, they proceeded very quickly with the upgunning of their vehicles, but those programs were already well in place. The only reason that the long five centimeter, the L60, hadn't been introduced was because Krupp were, had a stranglehold on the turret design, and they said they didn't want a bigger gun than a uh, five centimeter L42. And the, the thinking behind that was it, you don't want a gun that's sticking out and running into trees or buildings. <laughs> and it was more than adequate to defeat anything that it was coming up against. Rheinmetall had a, their design, which was an L60, and they said, oh, give us a turret and we'll put it in. And they did, and Uncle Adolf was delighted that they could do this, and straight away the, the long barrel five centimeter was in place. But the tactics and those guns were capable of destroying T-34s. But the big impact on this was that it accelerated the follow-on vehicles to the Panzer IV, the Panzer III, and so forth, because the Germans already had their Versuk series, the VK uh, series, being developed. And they were planning on a 30-ton battle tank with very modern features and so forth. And they were working on that, but it wasn't meant to come uh, as quickly as it did. That got accelerated, the spec got upped in terms of armor and gun capability, and the weight went up from 30 ton to 45 ton and became the Panther. And the uh, Tiger got redeveloped to become the Tiger II. So those designs came rather more quickly from the tank panic, but not because of. There's a myth about that. These were not developed because of the T-34. They were developed more quickly because of the T-34. All right, so uh, first question for the audience now, uh, talking about large, uh, large things that need a bigger gun. Robert, where are you? Stood up, and please loudly vocalize your question. Okay, so generally for the, for the microphones, so the question is, why did the American Army never use guns quite as capable as those of the British Army, in, in a nutshell? Um, getting back to that question we had earlier, or the discussion we had earlier about requirements, um, Army Ground Forces, McNair's operation, um, had two criteria for tank designs. They needed to be battle-worthy, and there had to be a battle need. And the battle need thing is a very important criteria. They needed somebody out in the field there or ar uh, the armor command itself to say, we need a bigger gun. And uh, the armor force didn't think that they needed a bigger gun because they had faced German heavy tanks. For example, the, the Tiger uh, at Kasserine Pass and later on in Tunisia, they had encountered the Tiger again and at Sicily. They had encountered the Tiger again in Italy. It had never been much of a tactical problem. There was no big demand in the field for a bigger gun. 
um, there was this understanding that the only way that, our, that the senior army officials would authorize it is if there was a perceived battle need. That battle need did not exist until the summer of 1944 when the U.S. Army starts encountering the Panther. Now, the U.S. Army knew about the Panther. The Panther obviously was introduced into combat at Kursk in 1943. There were U.S. attache teams over in Moscow. They were shown the Panther. They knew what kind of armor it had. They knew what kind of firepower it had. So you'd think, aha, we need a bigger gun. The problem is the Army made a big mis or the Army had a big misunderstanding. They thought the Panther was like Tiger, that it was a core level specialized vehicle that would be issued in very, very small numbers. They did not understand that it was going to become the new main battle tank, the battle tank of the Panzer divisions, not of the special heavy tank Abteilung. So there was a serious misunderstanding. In April 1944, Army intelligence suddenly discovers that Panther is going to be introduced in the Panzer divisions. And there's a sudden, I don't want to call it a tank panic because it wasn't that big a thing. The U.S. Army turns to Britain. They had seen the Firefly. The Army starts a program at that point to try to either obtain the 17-pounder, but there's a lot of controversy about that. Should they introduce um, a, a foreign gun design? It's not so much that it's foreign, but it introduces the problem of producing a new generation of ammunition, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it all becomes something of a moot point. There is a tank crisis in the summer of 1944 after the Panther is encountered. But as soon as the crisis emerges, it disappears. I've seen the Army documents from August, uh, September 1944, after the Panzer divisions are smashed at Falaise Gap and in the later battles. And the attitude is, we've destroyed the German armor force. We don't have to worry about it. Now, there is, in fact, some programs going on, the most important of which is, is HVAP, the, the new generation ammunition. They think that that will be the solution. There are other vehicles coming online, the M36 tank destroyer with the 90 millimeter gun. There is the T26E3 Pershing tank that um, is being accepted for production, although rather slowly for a variety of reasons. So um, that was the reason. But the, the, the key reason actually in this case is doctrinal. Army ground forces has a certain set of rules, and the rules are mistaken. That battle need is a really, really bad rule. It doesn't anticipate what the enemy is going to do. All the key designs, if you go back and look at T-34, when the Russians first designed T-34, there was no battle need for T-34. But some of the designers said, for our next generation tank, we need to deal with the enemy's next generation tank. We have to be better. The, the U.S. Army missed that point. So well, actually, could also the, uh, the Russians before uh, the invasion had actually purchased uh, Panzer III and had a Panzer III for examination. Uh, well, it's, I mean, it's a segue onto the tank destroyers. Again, the, the common perception, tanks don't need to fight other tanks. Let's let the tank destroyer do it. So the American tank destroyer rep gets a very bad rep, which uh, I think is falls squarely in your, your department there, Harry. Yes, well, I, I hope I've uh, already demolished that argument. No, the, the uh, tank destroyer comment, uh, you have to think back to the psychological situation that U.S. planners found themselves in. Uh, they're gearing up to go to war, uh, and the one thing they know for sure is that the vaunted French army crumbled before the Panzers. Uh, the Soviet army appears to be crumbling before the Panzers. Nobody has figured out a way to stop a Blitzkrieg. And you have to give them a certain amount of credit, I think, for thinking out of the box. They, they saw a problem. They had no equipment to work with. Uh, they had to craft a doctrine in a vacuum. And they, they came up with a plan uh, to create a tank destroyer force that could stop Hitler's panzers. Uh, I mean, the, implementing that in terms of hardware was going to be a problem. Uh, they wound up having to, to live with stop gaps. But it's really not the equipment that gets bashed as much as the fact that there was an independent tank destroyer force and the doctrine didn't seem to work very well. Well, the doctrine had, had uh, some real internal problems. Uh, the key one, in my view, is that it was geared to a defensive mindset. Uh, it, it anticipated that you were going to be fighting against a force with a lot of armor that was attacking you. Uh, and it, it, it didn't really think very hard about what you were going to do with all these tank destroyer units uh, if you were on the offensive. And of course, from the time we came into contact with German forces, we were on the offensive. The doctrine also assumed 
that commanders would keep these highly lethal vehicles sitting around somewhere so that if a, an attack came, they could all rush to the point of crisis and blow up all the, the German tanks. And commanders weren't that stupid. Uh, they, they, they had all these wonderful uh, destructive weapons sitting around and uh, they were going to use them by God. Uh, it, I guess we might talk about the, the, the general American approach to armored warfare uh, a bit later, but what, what wound up happening in, uh, in North Africa was the tank destroyer force was, was scattered like pebbles across the front. Uh, so you, you reach the point of crisis in the Battle of Kasserine uh, where doctrine says they're going to swarm to the point of crisis and stop the German attack, and they're, they're coming in dribs and drabs. Uh, a company here, a company there, and the doctrine just never never functions. Uh, but I guess my view is it, it wound up not mattering. Uh, doctrine is the thing that, that breaks. It's like uh, no plan surviving first contact with the enemy. And when your life is on the line, you come up with other solutions, and people found very useful things to do with the tank destroyers. I mean, they wound up being used essentially as tanks, uh, especially uh, uh, in the European theater. Uh, they wound up playing a very important role as additional artillery. That was one of their key uh, roles in uh, Italy where people were kind of surprised to learn that, uh, that the tank destroyer round had a burst radius the same as a 105 uh, howitzer, uh, but it didn't create huge holes in roads and stuff that you plan to advance over. Uh, so. Uh, I don't think it deserves the bad reputation. So the problem was in practice, at least when you, uh, you read the after action reports, the fact that it was the speediest armored fighting vehicle on the battlefield wound up making no real difference because uh, when they were shooting, they were typically sitting still, of course, and tactical movement was very slow. That there was one advantage to the speed of the M18, and that was that it could keep up with the mechanized cavalry. Uh, so in Third Army in particular, they would assign the M18 tank destroyer battalions to work with the cavalry, so they had some real firepower uh, if they ran into to problems while they were ranging far ahead of the rest of the army. But uh, this is the... By the time this thing came out, uh, it has a 76 millimeter gun on it, which uh, is essentially the same weapon as on the M10, which is a three incher. And uh, they thought that would be the weapon that could beat anything the Germans had. But by the time the M18 actually uh, came into service, the, there were two prototypes that fought at Anzio, uh, but really it came into uh, to service in France. Uh, the 76 millimeter gun was already uh, proving insufficient to penetrate the front armor on the Panther or the Tiger.